You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between. Between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. It's a long way to Tipperary. It's a long way to go. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 155. This week we have something special, an episode filled with listener questions. When I originally asked for questions a few months ago, I honestly did not expect much of a response. The last time I asked for questions, I barely got enough for a full episode, but this time was different. Currently, there are enough questions to fill about three episodes, maybe four, depending on how things goes. And this means that every few months for the rest of the year, we will be doing another episode full of listener questions. This also means that if you have a question you want me to answer, there is still time. And one final bit, if you did ask a question already, I will get to it eventually. I've tried to sort of group them in some logical ways. So if your question doesn't show up here, it will eventually. If you have more questions for me, though, hit me up at historyofthegreatwar at outlook.com, facebook.com slash historyofthegreatwar, or twitter.com slash historygreatwar. Before we get to the questions, though, I have a correction. Now, it's been a little while since I've had a correction, but this one comes from listener David. Now, during the episodes on the Middle Eastern campaign, I multiple times referred to the Australian light horse as cavalry. This is not technically correct. And they were actually mounted infantry or mounted rifles, depending on where you fall on that particular argument. Basically, they were not trained for the traditional cavalry charge, and they were created and organized and trained to only use their horses for mobility and then to dismount when it came time to actually attack. This is important, and many cavalrymen and mounted infantry troops at the time probably would have made a point to make sure that they were properly categorized. It should also be noted that during the last two years of the war, the Australian light horse started to look more and more like traditional cavalry, as their armament and tactics changed due to their combat experiences like those at Gaza and other battles in the Middle East. It was a small clarification, but it is important, so thank you, David. We start with a question from a longtime listener, and a longtime Patreon supporter, Patrick. And here's his question. What were the solutions developed for the offensive regarding mobility for exploitation used by the British in the Near East Theater? Could those solutions have been applied in the West by either side? Were the Allies and Central Powers decisions makers in the West arrogantly blind to lessons learned in other theaters? That's a really good question. But before I start this answer, I should probably start with my opinion on the Western Front situation, since it sort of informs it. Over the course of the last several years, I've become convinced that the Western Front was an insolvable puzzle. There were just too many men, in too many areas, with too much defensive mobility. During the war, there were two types of mobility, defensive and offensive. And defensive mobility during the war was a strategic concern, and mostly revolved around railroads. They were the only way to move the number of troops and material around in the quantities that were required, and they benefited the defender far more than the attacker. The Germans made perhaps the best use of this mobility throughout the war, and it allowed them to move troops between the Western, Eastern, Italian, Russian, all different fronts as they needed. 
However, this does not mean that the Entente did not also benefit. During the early days of the war in 1914, the French used railroads on the defensive to quickly shift troops towards Paris, and then to launch the Battle of the Marne. In all of these cases, the defenders were able to identify and experience an attack, and then still be able to quickly move in troops and supplies to meet it. We can contrast this to what the attackers had access to. They could and had to use railroads to prepare for an offensive. However, when it came time to advance, they would have to move forward. And when they did, the rails could not follow. This put a hard cap on how fast the troops could move forward, roughly as fast as they could walk for as long as they could walk. There were also serious limits on the volume of supplies that could be moved forward with them. These facts were true from the beginning until the end of the war, first seen in the German advances through Belgium and northern France, and then in the Entente attacks of 1915 to 1917, then in the German offensives of early 1918. Even at the end, during the Hundred Days, the Allies were reaching the end of their supply tether when the war ended. Many of these restrictions still applied in the Middle East. However, there were some other factors that reduced their power. When you look at the actions in the Middle East, especially in Palestine and Syria, they stand out because of actions like cavalry charges, mounted infantry actions, flanking maneuvers. Sometimes entire actions were built around them, like at Beersheba. There were even deep raids into the rear of the enemy front lines. When you investigate these actions, what is clear is that the tactics, goals, and execution by the British, Arabs, and Ottomans is Actually, pretty traditional. Mounted troops seeking a flank, then attacking when they found the opportunity. Or mounted troops positioned to cut off a retreat or to pursue a fleeing enemy. These were all ideas that generals wanted to put in place on the Western Front, usually to a fault. But the difference between the theaters made it almost impossible. On the Western Front, flanks were non-existent, and the number of men present cannot be ignored. To make any sort of large cavalry action, or to use cavalry as a mobile attacking force, would have required a much larger force than any army had even at the beginning of the war. Even if those numbers could have been found, they would have required such a quantity of supplies and provisions that supply would have been a serious problem. In 1917, even with just a few divisions of cavalry behind the front, the British still had issues trying to keep the horses properly fed, on top of what had to go to the artillery and to other horses. Even if these troops could have been supplied at rest, keeping them supplied during an offensive would have been even more difficult due to the amount of fodder that would have been required. I should probably also note here that the Western Front generals were a bit arrogant, and they did oftentimes think that the other theaters were below them. Uh, You can also see this when generals end up moving from the Western Front to the Middle East like Allenby did. But that really isn't the answer to the question, even though even if the Middle East would have had something that would have helped, it may not have migrated to the Western Front in time. Our second question comes from Mike, who asked, How did battlefield care of the wounded evolve from the beginning of the war to its conclusion? And did the involvement of the United States improve that care or the way it was delivered? I am at this very moment about to finish a lengthy series of Patreon episodes on this very topic, so this question comes at a really good time. Battlefield care certainly evolved during the war, both in how wounds were treated and how the soldiers who were wounded were treated. Just like every other aspect of the war, nobody was really prepared for the scale of what was going to happen after 1914, and nobody was prepared for how many wounded men they would soon have to treat. In this problem, the static nature of the fighting actually helped. Before the war, everybody was planning on a more mobile conflict, and therefore they expected to have to provide mobile care. As the line became stagnant and then static, a lo- average level of care actually rose as base hospitals could move closer to the front, and casualty clearing stations or their equivalents could become larger, better prepared, and permanent transportation arrangements could be created between the two. Overall, care on the Western Front was quite good. The biggest problem was getting them off the battlefield, which was a Herculean task. This was especially true in areas like Flanders, as we discussed in the uh, Passchendaele episode a few months ago. Since medical care is a very large topic, I'm going to just discuss two areas that saw significant change during the war. First, blood transfusions, and then how the British treated battlefield wounds. One of the big innovations that would be widely used during the war, and which would save countless lives, was blood transfusions. 
Blood transfusions had been used before the war, but it was still a relatively new method of treatment for blood loss. It had only been in 1901 that doctors had begun to determine that there were different blood types, and that they were generally incompatible, which was obviously a pretty important step to making blood transfusions work on a large scale. By 1917, blood transfusions would be a critical part of the treatment of battlefield wounds, and part of this transition was the discovery of ways to store blood for a lengthy period of time, just like we do today. Before this innovation, blood transfusions had to be directly done from one person to another, but it was discovered that if the blood was kept cold and it was mixed with an anticoagulant, it could be kept for a reasonable amount of time. This change was obviously critical to allowing the armies to bank up a large amount of blood that could then be used during large attacks. It is difficult to overstate how important blood transfusions were to saving lives during the war, especially with so many cases of large blood loss before patients even arrived at an aid station. When looking at how the British treated wounds during the war, it's first important to discuss the events of the Boer War. Just like in so many other areas, the British medical officers were trained to fight the last war, not the one in front of them. And during the Boer War, there were a very specific set of conditions that they were trained to. Most of the fighting in southern Africa had occurred on the South African veldt, or uncultivated land. This was quite different than the areas that the British would be fighting over on the Western Front. Flanders and northern France were heavily cultivated, and this meant it was very easy for wounds to become contaminated and for infection to set in. Another problem for the British is that so many of the wounds would not be caused by bullets, which generally leave nice, clean, tidy wounds, but instead by artillery shells. When an artillery shell explodes, oddly shaped bits go spinning and flying in weird ways, and when those oddly shaped bits hit a squishy human, all kinds of bad things can happen. These wounds would then be contaminated by dirt and mud that the shells had hit along the way, and any of a million other things. Because of this, the primary method of treatment for the British Army before the war basically amounted to cleaning it out a bit and then covering it up, and this was found to be completely insufficient. Instead, over the course of many wasted months, they developed new methods that involved large-scale excision of the wound. Now, excision involved the following steps. The skin around the wound would be cleaned as much as possible, then matter would be removed. This removal involved cutting out damaged tissue, paying special attention to any foreign objects, like dirt or debris. Then the wound would be cleaned with an antiseptic solution, iodine being popular, then it would be washed with saline. Removing any contaminated tissue was critical, as was doing the excision as soon as possible. Before the war, the British had favored doing little evasive surgical work near the front, instead believing that the breast process was to transport the men to base hospitals without doing anything drastic. I will let Sir Anthony Bowlby, a leading figure in British medical changes, describe why this was a very bad plan. Quote, it is absolutely essential for success that excision be done as soon as possible after the infliction of an extensive wound, because in such cases gas gangrene may become widely spread within 24 hours. It is therefore necessary to operate on such cases before the patient is sent to by train to the base, and he will seldom be surgically treated there until more than 24 hours have elapsed since the time that he was wounded. This method of treatment has entirely supplanted the application of strong antiseptics to a recent wound, or the use of continual saline infusions. It is a method whose value is agreed upon by the surgeons of all the Allies, and has recently been unanimously approved by the meeting of the surgeons of the Allied armies in Paris. The last bit of Mike's question revolves around the United States. The entry of the United States into the war and the arrival of the American Expeditionary Force did not have an appreciable effect on the medical side of the conflict. They also did not do a great job of taking care of their own soldiers. Just like in many other aspects of the American war effort in Europe, the tactics, technology, and training of the AEF was far closer to the standards of 1914 than 1918, and this meant that there were not enough doctors, not enough medical facilities, and not enough transport available to evacuate the wounded, and the training given to those doctors was not sufficient for the task at hand. It was not a good look, and it's something that we will discuss in future episodes when the American Expeditionary Force actually gets into the fighting. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. 
In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com GW50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com GW50 to get 50% off. The regular season is heating up. New stars are emerging, and that means more opportunities to win up to 25 times your cash on prize picks. The most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projection on a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's that easy. Let it fly to turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what make Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Watch your favorite players and get paid doing it this basketball season. See your entries make progress during the game or make new entries for the second half in the fourth quarter. Three pointers, assists, rebounds, and everything in between are yours for the taking. Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy. Our third question is from listener Andy who asks, so why did the British attacks at Passchendaele fail so spectacularly in the autumn of 1917, when similar equipment and tactics succeeded so completely in autumn 1918 that won the war? Was it really just the rain and mud or German exhaustion, both on the front after failed attacks, overextended supply lines, and on the home front, or was there something else that tipped the balance? So to start with this question, let's discuss a bit about the situation at Passchendaele, and really most of the Entente attacks between 1915 and 1917, there's some variation in there, and some of the big mistakes that the British would make before and during the offensive. First of all, the attacks were performed against positions that the Germans had occupied for the better part of four years. This was true of most of the front in late 1917, save the Hindenburg Line only, but enough work had been put into those defenses to make up for their short occupancy. The British were also launching their attacks when the Germans were in one of their best positions since early 1915. Italy would soon almost be knocked out of the war at Caporetto, the Russians would be on their way out after their summer offensives in June, and the French army was still recovering from mutinies. This allowed the Germans the freedom to move in troops, almost as many as were required, during the six months of the attacks in Flanders. The next problem was that the British were still using incredibly long bombardments before their attacks, which gave the Germans plenty of warning. They were also attacking on a relatively small area of the front when compared to the entire length of the Western Theater. They compounded this problem by attacking out of the Ypres salient, which further restricted their ability to move or conceal their preparations. Finally, the attacks would be continued far too long far past the point of any sanity, and while the weather was acceptable early on, by the end they were trudging through a muddy mess. I think that's a pretty reasonable summary of why the British failed at Passchendaele. Obviously there's a whole episode that you can go listen to if if you want to. But now let's shift our focus and look at the differences between Passchendaele and the Allied attacks in 1918. In their spring and summer attacks, the Germans willfully sacrificed two very important and irreplaceable pieces of their defenses from the previous three years of fighting. The first sacrifice was their prepared defensive positions. The line in the west had been relatively static since the end of 1914, and the Germans had used that time to build up their defensive networks to what I would call an absurd degree. This was true on the Chem de Dom, it was true at Passchendaele, and everywhere in between where the Germans occupied the Hindenburg Line and its offshoots. These positions were strong, safe, and built to a depth that for many years made a large-scale offensive operation seem impossible for the British and French. They also, critically, provided at least some safety from the gargantuan artillery barrages that had become typical of Anton attacks by the beginning of 1918. When the Germans attacked and they made progress, 
They pushed away from these defenses, and all along the front they would be put into territory that had not been occupied by either side during the war. The only area where that was not true was on the old Sum battlefield, which presented its whole other series of problems for them. After they made these advances, and they did not win the war, they would have only days, not years, to dig and prepare their new defenses for the coming Allied attacks, and that was just not enough time. This made it far easier for the Allies to attack and to make actual progress, partially due to how vulnerable it made the Germans to Allied artillery. When this vulnerability was combined with the growing Allied artillery advantage, well, it would not go well for the German Empire. The second major item that the Germans gave away was manpower. Throughout 1915, 1916, and 1917, the Germans had never held a manpower advantage on the Western Front. They had often faced the large Entente attacks with fewer men, but they had always been able to move in more troops as the fighting went on week after week and month after month. These new troops would come in on the scene somewhat fresh and prevent any sort of large-scale breakthrough. During early 1918, the situation was different. With the final removal of Russia from the war, German divisions came streaming from the east, and Ludendorff used this new manpower advantage to launch his attack. But the attacks would fail. And by the time that they did, the Germans had lost so many men, so many irreplaceable men, that they were not once again at a disadvantage, but it was also growing day by day as more Americans arrived. They had faced this problem before, but this time there was one big difference. This time there was no more reserves, no more formations to pull from other fronts, fronts that no longer existed, no more recruits back home. What the Germans had at the front, already spread thin, was all they had. This meant that as the Allies started and continued their attacks, the Germans could not do what they had always done, pull troops from elsewhere and launch counterattacks. It is difficult to exaggerate how thinly stretched the Germans made themselves in the spring and summer of 1918, as they advanced deeper and deeper into large salients along the front. They had to pull reserves from everywhere to keep the attacks going, and when they finally stopped, they would be in trouble. Both of these problems were inflicted on the Germans by their own actions. However, there were two things that the Allies did to exacerbate and fully capitalize on them. The largest difference was in the coordination of all of the Allied armies at one time. All along the front, the Allies would have the ability and desire to launch offensives, from Flanders in the north to the Argonne in the south. This was made only possible by the creation of the Supreme War Council, and the elevation of Foch as Supreme Commander of all the Allied forces in Western Europe. By launching attack after attack on divergent objectives, the German army was unable to easily use the few reserves that it did have, and once the retreat began, it became difficult to stop. It should be noted that not all of these attacks were greatly successful, especially in areas where the Germans were occupying older defensive lines, like in the Argonne. But the pressure from all along the front contributed to the successful attacks being really successful, because they simply couldn't move more troops into those areas. Along with the large number of attacks, the Allies also changed how they attacked in 1918. Well, at least the British did. The biggest and by far the most obvious of these changes was in how artillery was used before the infantry went forward. At Passchendaele and Machine, the British artillery fire had lasted for weeks, but by the time of the Hundred Days offensives, the British were forbidding their artillery to fire for more than 48 hours. This was only possible due to the qualitative and quantitative improvements that had been made to the British artillery. It also represented a shift in what they thought the artillery should and could be used for. Instead of being used to destroy the frontline defenses in detail, artillery was instead just used to suppress the enemy defenses and to hammer the enemy artillery as much as possible. This made the attacks far more likely to succeed, since the Germans had less time to prepare their response, much like at Cambrai in late 1917, and it made surprise actually possible. Now that was a pretty lengthy answer, but that is just a tiny preview of what we will be discussing over the coming months. We will be discussing the events on the Western Front from the German attacks in March until the Armistice in November over the course of roughly 22 episodes starting in May of this year and running all the way into October, so expect a lot more discussion on this topic. Our final question today comes from listener Owen, who asked, Did the Easter 1916 Rising have any short or long-term impact on Irish troops in the trenches by those commanding them? Could ask the same about the decision not to introduce conscription in Ireland. 
Now, it took some time before news of the rising reached the front lines, and initially the news was quite sketchy. Many men believed that it was a simple workers' riot, which was not unheard of during the war as expectations of factory workers continued to rise as demands at the front grew. However, as more information and correct information came to the front, the overwhelming feeling among the Irish troops varied depending on their own views. Unionists, which made up most of the Irish officers, had a similar to reaction to those experienced by every British soldier. However, the nationalists were somewhat more interesting. While the rebels were fighting for a cause that the nationalists believe in, they did not like that it was happening while they were off fighting a war. Some units would not find out about the rising until they came off the lines, and for units of the 16th Irish Division, they would be recovering from a gas attack when they found out. In general, a good word to describe their overall feelings of the nationalist Irish troops was one of disappointment. When they returned home, they would find themselves in a somewhat ambiguous situation. They had just spent several years fighting for the country that had been on the wrong side of the rising, and Eugene Sheehy, one of the soldiers, would say that, quote, as the tide of Irish public opinion gradually changed and hostility to England grew, we did not quite know where we stood or where our duty lay. I think it's also interesting to look at the views of Irish veterans after the war, and a good source for this information is an article by Peter Karsten entitled Irish Soldiers in the British Army, 1792-1922, Suborned or Subordinate. In this work, Karsten says that after the war, many veterans did not join Sinn Féin or the IRA, and in fact, there, were often, there was often a lot of tension between these groups and the veterans' organizations, like the British Legion or the Comrades of the Great War. In Politics and Irish Life, 1913-1921, David Fitzpatrick would say that many Irish veterans hated Sinn Féin and its members, saying, quote, for having kept out of the war and envied them their settled jobs, end quote. One IRA general would say that the Irish Free State Army of 1922 would be made up of many men who had fought hard against them in the War of Independence. When the Treaty of 1922 came up for a vote, The areas of Ireland that had provided the most volunteers during the Great War were often the ones that voted strongly for the treaty. This was opposed by areas on the western side of Ireland who rejected the treaty, instead wanting to fight on to obtain more of Northern Ireland. These were also the areas where the fewest number of volunteers had been found during the Great War. On the second part of your question, the reaction at the front to the question of Irish conscription, I couldn't find anything really concrete as I read around. If anybody out there has anything and would not mind sending it my way, I will include that information in a future questions episode. So that's all for now. Thank you, Patrick, Mike, Andy, and Owen for your questions. If you ask a question, fear not, it will be included in a future episode. And if you have questions for me out there, feel free to send them, historyofthegreatwar at outlook.com, facebook.com slash historyofthegreatwar, or twitter.com slash historygreatwar. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode as we tie up some loose ends on our story of the Great War in the air. I pick a day.